The scripture for today is from Psalm 81. Rejoice out loud to God our strength. Shout for joy to Jacob's God. Take up a song and strike the drum, sweet lyre along with the harp. Blow the horn on the new moon as the full moon of our day of celebration. Because this is the law for Israel, this is the rule of Jacob's God. He made it a decree for Joseph. When he went out against the land of Egypt, when I heard a language I did not yet know. I lifted the burden off your shoulders. Your hands are free of the brick basket. In distress, you cried out, so I rescued you, and I answered you in the secret of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Listen, my people, I'm warning you. If only you would listen to me, Israel. There must be no foreign god among you. You must not bow down to any strange deity. I am the Lord your God who brought you up from Egypt's land. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it up. But my people wouldn't listen to my voice. Israel simply wasn't agreeable toward me. So I sent them off to follow their willful hearts and they followed their own advice. How I wish my people would listen to me. How I wish Israel would walk in my ways. Then I would subdue their enemies in a second. I would turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord will grovel before me, and their doom would last forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with honey from the rock. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. Thank you, Emily. I would like to begin this message by congratulating again all of the recent high school and college graduates. And hey, if you graduated from something going on in work too, congratulations. Really, truly. I mean, any educational achievement is, is a reason to celebrate. These are major milestones, but especially as we think about college and high school graduation, they oftentimes come with a lot of anxiety around the transitions that lie before you. Transitions into college, transitions into the workforce, transitions in living arrangements, and even locations of where we are living. These are just some of the changes that come with the milestone of graduation. And I want you to hear, as graduates and as a community of family and friends of graduates, that it's important to care for your own mental health in times of transition. Now, any one of these sermons within this sermon series would be appropriate to celebrate with graduation, to remind ourselves of the stigma surrounding mental health that it should not deter us from asking for help, to hear strategies and navigating the stress and anxiety that comes within these transitions, and even to realize that depression can be amplified when we are leaving what we know, whether that be our friends and our family or our physical locations. And if any of these topics are ones that you need to hear, please check out the worship videos on our Facebook page or on our website. But today we are talking about substance abuse, and I want you all to hear that this is just how the calendar happened to be. I'm not suggesting that substance abuse is linked with graduation, nor am I suggesting that this sermon is just for college graduates, because substance abuse can be anyone's reality. And it's something that comes with its own stigma, its own anxiety, and something that I would guess most of us have experienced, either in our own lives or we know someone who uses within our lives. So let me begin by cutting to the chase. Substance abuse is a powerful chemical reaction within our brains that is nearly impossible to navigate solely on our own. We are not here today to convince any of you that you have a substance use issue. So please do not come to church today and leave feeling that you have been diagnosed with a disease. That's not the intention of today. We are not here today to 
suggest that anyone in particular needs to go and seek treatment or join a support group, although if those things are helpful for you, please do that. We're here today to talk about something that significantly impacts our lives, a topic that is sometimes easier to avoid because, let's just face it, it's hard to talk about. Now let me tell you quick the whole point of the sermon right now with one quote from Johann Hari. He says, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Now we're going to unpack that a little bit today, but if there's nothing else that you remember, remember that. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Now, before we can understand what all of that means, we need to understand substance abuse a little bit. Now, we are not looking at any kind, we're not looking at just any kind of addiction today because addiction can focus in different parts of our minds, it can affect us in different ways. So, today we are specifically looking at substance use disorders. And from a personal standpoint, that's partially because that's all my mind could comprehend as I was learning about one subject this week. This is when substance use disorder is when we take a mood-altering substance like alcohol or other drugs in a way that negatively impacts our lives. And I, I throw in there the negatively intentionally because we are not talking about a casual drink with friends on Friday night around a campfire. By all means, that's fine. We're not talking about medicine that is prescribed to control pain and when the pain stops, the medicine stops. That, again, is an appropriate use of the medicine that's given to you. A substance use disorder is when you wake up in the morning and feel the need to reach for whatever bottle that you might feel you need immediately. It's when your family, your friends, your work, your school fades into the background and the substance becomes your motivating factor. Please note, that reaching for that bottle, whatever it might look like, is not necessarily a voluntary choice because these are substance abuses. They have chemicals within them that chemically alter the function of our brains. Now, in talking with Emily Johnson about this, she used a great image that I'm really happy she gave me permission to use because I was going to ask for forgiveness later than permission first, but she gave the permission for it. She compared substance use to the Vegas Strip, if you can imagine that. The idea of all the breathtaking lights that are blinking and illuminating the night with captivating neon color. And this is what our minds do when we take substances. It lights up our brain. It feels good. It may even feel like we are bringing our loved ones on vacation, trying to show them the beauty, the good time that is before us. And show them maybe a more laid-back, relaxed, and fun-loving side that we might want to be more often. But at some point, the substance starts to wear off and the lights start to fade. And this is when you might be tempted to take another drink or pop another pill to give the lights just a little bit more voltage. And over time, you start to develop a tolerance for the substance, and tolerance in most places is considered a good thing. But here, the tolerance means that as you're taking those substances, the lights don't quite light up as much. Your body is used to it. So you feel a need to take another drink, to take a couple more pills, whatever it might be. You do everything that you can to try to intensify those lights so that they're as bright as when you experience them your first time. But here's the challenge in all of that. Everything has shifted to be about those lights. At one point, you may have told yourself that it's to show your family a good time. You might be thinking that you're more laid back and fun to be around when you're drunk or when you're high. But as you focus all of your attention on consuming substances to light up your brain, you start to focus on that light and you lose focus on your family. You lose focus on your career, on your schooling. You even lose focus on caring for yourself because your brain needs to be illuminated. Now, I wish I could say that this was merely a thought experiment, but Wisconsin is the third highest state in the United States for total number of adults who drink. 
or drink alcohol. Let me make sure that I specify that. Now, that was actually kind of a surprise for me. Honestly, I thought we would have been number one. I mean, and quite honestly, I, I, mean, I grew up in Stevens Point, where every, every Thursday night, every Friday night, every Saturday night, you spent it on the square. And while we are third for the number of adults that consume alcohol, we are number one, the highest in the United States, for the total amount of alcohol consumed. Drinking, on average, 2.6 drinks per occasion. Now, drugs, on the other hand, have steadily risen in our nation as opioids have become far too commonplace. Did you know that in 2020, the last time that the statistics had been compiled for, in 2020, our nation had the most drug overdoses on record. In the year of 2020, we had more drug overdoses than any other year in our history. There was 93,331 overdoses in one year. 93,331. That is nearly six times the population of Beaver Dam in drug overdoses in a single year. Substance use disorder is a real thing, and it's literally destroying the lives of so many individuals and so many families around the nation. And so today we gather and we look for wisdom within our psalm. And I have to make a few confessions at the start of looking at the psalms. Primarily, this psalm is not about substance use or a substance use disorder. Yes, there were substances within biblical times. I mean, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. So we know that that's there. And yes, there are multiple instances where people have altered their mood because of how many substances they have taken within Scripture, yes. But it would be a stretch to suggest that there was a cultural understanding of addiction to substances. Or if there was a cultural understanding, it's not mentioned in the Scriptures that I am aware of. Now, while all that may be true, our psalm does not even mention any kind of substance. So the question is, why are we looking at this passage today? You'll also notice this psalm is written much differently than most others that we have looked at. All of the other ones so far have been written as a song or a prayer from the psalmist to God. But this one is written in the opposite way. It's written from the perspective of God. Rather than being a prayer or a song, one scholar suggests this may have even been a sermon, or at least part of a sermon. So now you can all go home and brag to your friends that at church today you heard not one but two sermons, and therefore you have extra credit. Congratulations. At the center of this psalm, however, is the problem that Israel has dealt with for almost its entire history. And that problem is idolatry, putting something in the place of God. In verse 9, the psalmist suggests God is instructing the Israelites to not allow foreign gods into their midst, to not bow down to any strange deity. And I've always found that phrase interesting, strange deity. What would classify another god as strange? Now, it didn't take very long before I, my first example came to mind, and that's when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, Egypt, and they crafted uh, out of gold a calf. Not a full-blown cow, but just a calf, and they worshipped it. That sounds strange to me. However, they had their reasons. We're not going to get into that today because that's a whole other sermon, but there was reasons behind doing what they did. Now, in a long drought in another part of Israel's history, they worshipped a cultural god of rain called Baal. Now, again, it may seem strange from an outsider's perspective to think, God has given you everything. Why would you stop now and worship Baal to get some rain? But you can imagine that they were already praying to God, trying to get the rain to come, and it didn't. So they tried other methods. They said, well, maybe God has given this section to Baal, so we'll just go ahead and we'll worship Baal right now, and we'll get the rain that we need. Again, there are logical reasons for why the Israelites are doing most of the things they're doing, but it's still taking them away from worshiping God. 
So yes, this passage does not talk about substance abuse. But I sometimes wonder if these mood-altering substances become idols within our own world. Something that from an outsider's perspective, if you're not the one working with it, might go, well, that's strange. Why would you do that? But there's always reasons. There's always rationales. And there's always a way to pour resources into something that might not be as life-giving as we might want it to be. So as you look at our psalm today, we kind of have good news, bad news. The good news is, yes, this passage does give us information on how to get past our idols. That's fantastic. The bad news of it is that we have to want it. We have to want to move past our idols and back to our, our divine family. God wants to help Israel, as we hear in verse 11, but the Israelites simply weren't agreeable with God. <laughs> I love that passage. They weren't agreeable, as if, yeah, you know, God, we just have different thoughts this time. But I, I hope that this doesn't sound defeating to any of you, because the truth is God is not going to snap God's fingers and make our idols disappear. God has given us free will, and it's up to us what our path is going to be. Now, let me give you another piece of bad news. It's very, very difficult to overcome idols on our own, especially when these idols light up our minds like the Vegas Strip and physically alter the chemistry within our brain. It's not that we're just making conscious choices at this point, but our brain is functioning in ways that maybe they weren't, it wasn't intended to to start with. Now, thankfully, 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 we were never intended to do this alone. And I love that God never rescinds the invitation into family for the Israelites. Even after saying that God will let the Israelites choose their own path, God continues to remind them that when they come back, God will subdue their enemies. God will feed them with the finest wheat and satisfy them with honey. And I love these promises from God because God is willing to let them do their own thing, to make their own choices, to even make their own mistakes, to find their own successes, whatever the case might be. And while God does not condone that behavior, God continues to love the people. This is the kind of love that can overcome idol worship. This is the kind of love that can break through substance abuse disorders. This is the kind of love which empowers us to put our lives back together one piece at a time. I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon that one line can sum up this entire sermon. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And this is what God offers the Israelites at all times, an open invitation to connection. God never looks at the Israelites and says, you know what, why don't you just go and sit in that corner for a little while until you can figure your stuff out? God does not say, you are miserable and you deserve every bad thing coming your way. God does not say those things. Instead, God just simply reminds the Israelites, I'm here and I love you. I'm here, and I love you. And those can be hard words to say to someone who maybe has a substance use disorder. Now, please, do not misunderstand me. If you live with someone who struggles with substance use, you may need to leave for your own mental, emotional, or physical safety. And if that's the case, please leave. Your health matters greatly. But as a culture, how often do we tell people struggling with substance abuse that, yes, we're loved and we support you, but we're going to do that from over here? Why don't you do your things over there and, you know, please don't talk to my kids because I'm not so sure about you? How often do we say, Oh, it's really great. I see you over there. I'm going to walk over here because I can't have that conversation right now. The Substance, use, uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, that's a mouthful, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration suggests that too often 
we try to treat problems with methods that, quote, focus on medical models, statistics, and abstract ideas that do not take fully into account the reality of a patient's situation and place too great of an emphasis on the individual as being the source of their own suffering, end quote. Too often we treat substance abuse as something an individual did to themselves, and by golly, if they did it to themselves, they gotta pull themselves back out of it. And yes, we'll be here and support them, but we're gonna do it from a distance because that's your stuff, this is my stuff over here. We need to recognize that there's a chemical dependency going on inside the brain. We need to stop defining people by a condition and reclaim the reality that these are our siblings in Christ. This is our family. This is why our support groups are so powerful. Because in support groups, everyone is seen as a sibling, as a peer, as an equal, as other members within that community. In these groups, members can express their authentic selves, show their brokenness, as we talked about in our Good Enough worship series, and through that brokenness, find healing and wholeness. As a culture, we need to drop the facade that we have it all together. We need to let go of the expectation that everyone is either perfect or at least 90% of the way there. We need to form authentic connections with one another and offer the kind of care and compassion which God has so freely offered to us. This is the route towards healing and wholeness. Authentic connection with one another and with God. Now, before I conclude, I need to offer a couple of caveats. We need to be searching for authentic connections with people who promote health and wholeness. In order to make space in your life for these people, you may need to create personal boundaries that prevent others that maybe are more interested in the, the harmful substance use or the harmful uh, patterns of behavior. We might need to create some boundaries around those people. Unfortunately, it may mean distancing yourself with people that you consider to be your friend, and that is not easy. It doesn't mean that we're excluding them from the family, but it means that we might need to create some boundaries for our own health. I'm not suggesting this is going to be easy or fun, but in order to find healing, we need to place ourselves in environments that are suited for health and wholeness. As a quick aside, I call that church. So if you're looking for a place for health and wholeness and healing and love and support, sign up for activities, just stop in, whatever the case, that's church for me. Another caveat is that we can only control ourselves. No matter how much we want to see our loved ones, um, you know, find that health and that wholeness, no matter how much we want to see them overcome a substance use disorder, they're the only ones that can make that decision. Likewise, if we are experiencing substance use disorder, we are the only ones that can make the decision to ask for help. We can encourage everyone in that direction, and we will continue to support you and say that we'll continue to support you, but we cannot make that decision for anyone other than ourselves. Please know that there are many in this congregation, myself included, that wants to see everyone living their best life the life that God intends for us with the finest wheat and honey. And I truly mean that about everyone, from first-time guests to members that are online to members that are listening on the radio to members that have been here for 90 years. Anyone and everyone is welcome. Each and every one of you are loved and valued. And no matter how much the world classifies you or how you would classify yourself, in this space, in this community, you are seen as a child of God, a sibling in Christ. You are one of the family, and no matter how much you may want to be erased from that picture, we're not going to Photoshop you out of it. Because we are a family, and we love and support you, and we're here for you. It's good to be on this road of mental health with all of you. It's good to hear God tell us that we are loved, that we are cared about, and that we have a God who wants to help us put the pieces of our lives back together again, one piece at a time. So may God bless this family, which we call church, in the days ahead. 
Amen. Good morning. I'm Emily Johnson. I'm a dual licensed therapist at Dodge County Health and Human Services. So I'm licensed in both mental health and substance abuse. It was really important for me to get licensed in substance abuse for both a personal and a professional level. Um, my family who are watching will joke that I love college and education. I uh, went and got my master's degree and then went and got dual licensed and additional education for substance abuse. Substance abuse has hit me personally. Uh, I think we all of us know whether or not we, we know someone, whether it's us individually or someone that we know. Uh, the other piece is I have talked to a lot of people uh, about today's Mental Health Minute. I have some notes. However, I have changed and thought about this in my head numerous times. I have written what I was going to say, scratched all of it because I felt it wasn't good enough. Stop it. I know. <laughs> Um, I, it wasn't uh, perfect. It wasn't genuine. I felt like I wasn't doing this uh, mental health minute any service. Uh, so I would like to share, uh, after being very kindly asked by Pastor Eric, uh, to ch share a little bit about my own personal story. Uh, when I say substance abuse has hit me personally, it has affected me. It was alcohol was my main coping skill. It was the center of my life. Uh, so in June 24th, uh, next month, I will achieve 10 years of sobriety from alcohol. This, <laughs> thank you. This has been a process. I would like to share each mental health minute. I share a little bit of kind of some coping skills. I assure you that I share all coping skills that have worked both for me personally um, and also for the clients that I work with. It has been very important to me to have the connection and the support that I have had in the people in my life. I will tell you that I have missed family holidays. I have missed family functions and vacations because I couldn't maintain my sobriety and keep my sobriety safe. That was a personal decision for me. I have lost friends because the only thing we had in common was alcohol. I became no longer the fun person. I assure you today I can still have a lot of fun without alcohol. It has no longer been the center of my life. This has been something that I decided that I was no longer the person of who I wanted to be. I was no longer my true actual self. Some of the things that also helped me is identifying my personal uh, triggers. So those are people, places, and things, right? I talked about my friends and my family. I talked about places that I know I can't be safe, okay? This is about taking it one day at a time. I take an inventory. How am I feeling in that moment? Certain days I can put myself in that situation. Certain days I know that I cannot. Please set healthy boundaries within yourself. I have been able to verbalize. I have been able to be assertive, which were all skills on setting boundaries that I probably did not have. So these are all really important to not only work with yourself, but also work with family members who are struggling with substance abuse as well. I bring my own water bottle everywhere. This has become my security blanket. This has become, we have amazing hospitality in the state of Wisconsin, and people will offer you something to drink if you go to an event and have an empty hand. However, they will not offer you something if you have something already in your hand. Uh, travel mugs that can hide what you are drinking is a great way so that people don't judge you for not drinking. I assure you my sobriety and me maintaining uh, being sober is, has nothing to do with anyone else's alcohol use. This has everything to do with me. That has been also something very important that I learned. 
I have, again, the connection uh, with some amazing people. Some of you are in here. Uh, some of you are watching online. These are both my biological and my extended family. I could not have done this without them. Please keep in mind this connection is important. Going to support group meetings is also important. Asking for help, recognizing, I work with a lot of people who are voluntary and mandatory in substance abuse treatment. Not everybody really actually wants to maintain that sobriety or get sober. We have to figure out what is the reasoning for doing so. Please keep in mind, I share this story today. This has been extremely difficult for me to do this because I don't share this story very often. This is not about, my work is not about what I do with my own mental health and my sobriety. It has everything to do with the people that I work with. However, I have become the best version of myself and that has been very important and I would like to just share that with you guys. Thank you.